Hey there, my friends. My name is Anthony Sweat. Uh, welcome to the Unfolding Restoration series, where we get to look at how the restoration developed over time from the very beginning. In this video, in this lesson, we're going to talk about the birth of the Book of Mormon, uh, the coming forth of it, uh, what it teaches us, how it came forth, how it was translated, some of Joseph's experiences in bringing it forth, and I hope it's insightful for you as you look at this uh, marvelous book of Scripture that is almost without parallel uh, on the face of the earth. I want to kick off as, as we think about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. One of the phrases that seems to be associated with it is this idea that it's a marvelous work. As a matter of fact, uh, when Joseph Smith uh, was giving some of his early revelations in section 4, section 6, section 11, section 12, section 14, and section 18, all of those sections of the Doctrine and Covenants use this phrase, a marvelous work is about to come forth, or a great and marvelous work is about to come forth. Now, there's a lot of things that that could be, but it's interesting that all of those revelations that use that phrase are given before June of 1829, when the Book of Mormon is translated. After June of 1829, that phrase is no, no longer used. Uh, to me, I believe when the Lord is saying in these revelations, a marvelous work is about to come forth, He's meaning the marvel of the Book of Mormon. Now, one person that helped in bringing forth the Book of Mormon that often gets overlooked is Emma Smith. Emma Smith helped actually scribe, and in her words, she scribed the majority of the first 116 pages that end up getting lost that we'll talk about. She was intimately involved in the coming forth of the Book of Mormon as her husband uh, translated that record. Well, later in her life, in 1879, she was interviewed by her son, Joseph Smith III. He asks her some great questions. Like uh, one time he asks her question, are you sure that he had the plates at the time you were writing for him? She gives this wonderful testimony. Emma says, the plates often lay on the table without any attempt at concealment, wrapped in a small linen tablecloth, which I had given for him to fold them in. I once felt of the plates as they thus lay on the table, tracing their outline and shape. They seemed to be pliable like thick paper and would rustle with a metallic sound when the edges were moved by the thumb as one does sometimes thumb the edges of a book. What a beautiful tactile testimony there, by the way. But then he asks a great question, getting at this marvel of the Book of Mormon. He asks a, a, really a, a, an honest question, and I think it's a logical question. There's only a few ways the Book of Mormon could have come forth. Either Joseph Smith made it up himself, just off the top of his head, and he's some sort of creative, religious, literary genius, or he used a team of people and they fabricated it, or it came from God and was a translation of an ancient record. Those are a few of the options, but it's, it's log logically one of those very few options. So she's asked the question, question, could not Joseph Smith have dictated the Book of Mormon to you? Uh, Oliver Cowdery and others who wrote for him after having first written it or having first read it out, out of some other book. Listen to what Emma says. Answer. Joseph Smith could neither write nor dictate a coherent and a well-worded letter. And only the wife of a prophet can say that, by the way. Let alone dictating a book like the Book of Mormon. That kind of flies in the face of literary genius theory, by the way. But then notice what she says, and although I was an active participant in the scenes that transpired and was present during the translation of the plates and had cognizance of things as they transpired, it is marvelous to me, a marvel and a wonder as much as to anyone else. My belief is that the Book of Mormon is of divine authenticity. I have not the slightest doubt of it. That's from Emma Smith in an 1879 interview. I love that she herself bears her witness and then calls it a marvel and a wonder. And when you think of synonyms, take a look at, at this list of synonyms uh, for marvelous. This is just right off the internet when you type in synonyms. When the Lord says, a marvelous work is about to come forth, well, maybe a better way to think of it is a fantastic work, a remarkable work, an awesome work, a breathtaking, an awful work. Fabulous, wonderful, unusual, incredible, phenomenal, awe-inspiring, or some other ones that really fit the Book of Mormon, like bewildering, confounding, a difficult-to-believe work is about to come forth, an unimaginable work, a surprising work. 
a supernatural work is about to come forth. I think all of those are wonderful synonyms, and they encompass everything of what the Book of Mormon is. It is wonderful. Uh, it is unimaginable. It is striking. It is fantastic. It is remarkable. It is incomprehensible, as history has shown um, uh, with, with the book. So, take a look at this timeline. What I want to do is tell you some stories about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon within this timeline. Really, the Book of Mormon comes forward over um, roughly more than a four-year period of time as Joseph's waiting, but Joseph's going to get the plates in September of 1827, and it's not going to be until the summer of 1829 the book comes forward. So what happens? What's the story? What's the background? Well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about how Joseph even gets the plates in the first place. Now, when we talk about Joseph as a young man, you know, we're often, here's some photographs I'm putting up that I took while doing a photograph session for a painting that I did of the first vision. This is the model that I use. He's a great young man, a family friend. I love him to death, and he's a great kid. And here you see him posing, and I had him, you know, be somber and picture like he's seeing the father and the son so he could get the right look, and he did a great job. And we're used to thinking of teenage Joseph like this, but when the photo session was over, I also snapped some photos like this. Um, because he's just a regular teenager. As a matter of fact, there was a bunch of other kids with us, and they were goofing around and joking around in the middle of also posing for this serious, serious event. Because that's the way teenagers are. Uh, that's the way teenage boys are. And Joseph Smith was a teenage boy like everybody else, even after he saw the Father and the Son. He says after the first vision that the Lord was with him, and for many days he could rejoice, but a few months later, a few weeks later, a few years later, He's a normal person like you and I are, dealing with the normal day-to-day -day realities of life. And Joseph Smith says in section 20, verse 5 of the Doctrine and Covenants, he became entangled in the vanities of the world. Or in his 1832 history, Joseph says, quote, I fell into transgressions and sinned in many things which brought a wound upon my soul. He's talking about his years after the first vision as a teenager. Or in Joseph Smith history, chapter 1, verse 28, which we're all very familiar with, he says, quote, I was left to all kind of temptations, and mingling with all kinds of society, I frequently fell into many foolish errors, and displayed the weakness of youth and the foibles of human nature, which I am sorry to say, led me into divers temptations offensive in the sight of God. And what are some of those? He tells us himself, I was guilty of levity and sometimes associated with jovial company. Translation, he was a regular teenage boy. He says, don't think that I was guilty of any greater malignant sins, but he sometimes was probably too light-minded. He joked. Uh, he probably was insensitive. Maybe he got in some fights. Um, who knows? Maybe his friends weren't the best, and maybe he cared a little bit too much what his friends thought and did what his friends wanted to do. Sounds like a regular teenager uh, to me. Things that uh, we all, I think all of us, uh, our teenage years could maybe summarize many of those same statements. Well, some of the temptations and the company that he hung around with that maybe wasn't the best likely had to do with his treasure searching activities, looking for treasure, looking for buried things. I mean, a lot of these people in rural America are, they're digging in the earth. They're in the earth. The earth is growing and they're surviving off it. They're hearing tales of wonderful uh, people who inhabited this land before them, and it was not uncommon for them uh, to look for a lost or buried treasure. It's maybe even likely that you've looked for lost and buried treasure uh, before. Uh, I love the, the author Mark Twain, who was a contemporary of Joseph, growing up in roughly the same time in Missouri. Mark Twain writes uh, in his Adventures to Tom Sawyer, quote, There comes a time in every rightly constructed boy's life when he has a raging desire to go somewhere and dig for hidden treasure. This is right out of the 1825 Wayne Sentinel in Palmyra, a newspaper there. They reported that buried treasure had been found, quote, by the help of a mineral stone, which becomes transparent when placed in a hat and light excluded uh, from the face of him who looks into it. So, a little different, uh, you and I might think of metal detectors or, or digging things up, which uh, back then they would look into stones and try to see if people could see things uh, through stones to aid them in revelation, to find what was hidden in the earth. And although accounts vary, th this, this uh, was not uncommon in rural America. Uh, there were some in Joseph's local town who used seer stones or mineral stones. 
Uh, the Chases who were next door, a girl named Sally Chase, apparently had a green stone she, looks into, she looked into. And when Joseph was roughly 16 years old, although accounts somewhat vary, Joseph seems to have found his own seer stone when digging a well on the Willard Chase property. This is a painting that I did um, trying to show that scene of Joseph finding likely his brownstone when, when digging this well. Uh, Willard Chase himself remembers in 1833 when he was giving a reminiscence that Joseph and his brother came to dig a well on their family property and that Willard Chase claims he found the stone, by the way, and that Willard Chase then handed it to Joseph who, quote, placed the stone in a hat and quickly discovered that it was a seer stone and that Joseph kept it. Willard Chase, by the way, was upset over that, felt like it was, it was his that he should have hang, hung on to. This is a second-hand, uh, late reminiscence source, so bear that in mind. But Jens Wybie recalls that Eliza R. Snow said, who Eliza R. Snow was one of Joseph's plural wives, that, quote, this is an 1881 reminiscence, the prophet Joseph Smith had a peepstone called in the Book of Doctrine and Covenants, Gaslam, that he got by digging in a lady's garden 25 feet down in the ground. The Lord revealed to Joseph that such a stone was 25 feet down in the ground. But he, Joseph Smith, did not know how to get it. But he went to the lady there that owned the garden and asked if she did not wish to have a well dug in her garden. And she said yes. The prophet found the peepstone 25 feet down. Now again, secondhand, late reminiscence. But uh, these stories seem to be similar, that they were probably digging a well uh, when they found this, this seer stone. I do think it's interesting in that second source that it was the, the Lord, Eliza R. Snow felt like the Lord led him to that. And that word gazlam likely comes out of Alma 37, where the Lord says, I will prepare unto my servant gazlam a stone which shall shine forth. That's, that's usually the, the name either associated with Joseph or associated with the stone that's given to it later. The Joseph Smith papers a few years ago published uh, photographs of that stone, uh, Joseph, this brown stone. That brown stone was likely given to Oliver Cowdery. Oliver Cowdery kept it until he died. Oliver Cowdery's widow then gave it to Brigham Young's brother, Phineas. Phineas gave it to Brigham Young, and it's been in the possession of the church ever since. And we're grateful to the church and the Joseph Smith papers for photographing that stone and letting the church uh, see that, that relic. Uh, some people are, this is new information to them, which all of us have to discover information for the first time ourselves. It's not new information to a lot of scholars and other researchers of the church. As a matter of fact, this idea that Joseph had this uh, brownstone was actually in our earliest church's history. When B. H. Roberts published the 1930 Comprehensive History of the Church, so a hundred years ago nearly, he writes, quote, the seer stone referred to here was a chocolate-colored, somewhat egg-shaped stone which the prophet found while digging a well in company with his brother Hiram. It possessed the qualities of Urim and Thummim since by means of it, as described above, as well as by means of the interpreters found at the Nephite record, Joseph was able to translate the characters engraven on the plates. And we'll talk about where this brownstone comes into translation as well. But there's a source from nearly a hundred years ago in, in the history of the church that your grandma or and grandpa have on their shelf, which the problem is nobody read it, uh, but it's been there for a hundred years. Because of that, we're also grateful to the modern church today for giving us uh, maybe a more readable uh, history of the church, their narrative history of saints, and in volume one of saints, they also talk about this. Uh, from Saints volume one, on page 21, quote, like many people in the area, including his father, Joseph believed that God could reveal knowledge through objects like ro rods and stones, as he had done with Moses, Aaron, and others in the Bible. One day while Joseph was helping a neighbor dig a well, he came across a small stone buried deep in the earth, Aware that some people use special stones to search for lost objects or hidden treasure, Joseph wondered if he had found such a stone. Looking into it, he saw things invisible to the natural eye. Joseph's gift for using the stone impressed family members who saw it as a sign of divine favor. But even though he had the gift of a seer, Joseph was still unsure if God was pleased with him. That's a great line uh, from saints there, and we'll talk about why Joseph thinks that maybe God was, wasn't pleased with him. So encouraged by Joseph's own father, Joseph Smith Sr., and other neighbors, Joseph did use his gift to use his stone to be a seer to try to find lost and hidden things, including uh, valuable treasures. He was accompanied by people like Willard Chase, 
and also his friend Samuel Lawrence. They almost set up kind of a treasure hunting group. And I don't want you to think they were doing this every day, but, but it does seem to be something they engaged in uh, from time to time. So much so that Joseph's reputation as a seer and one who could see hidden things made it all the way down to southern New York and, and northern Pennsylvania. Uh, and a man named Josiah Stoll, who has a large property down on the border of Pennsylvania and New York, thinks that there's an abandoned old Spanish silver mine somewhere. He needs to find it and doesn't know where it's at, so he hears of this boy up in New York, in Palmyra, Manchester area. And Lucy Mack Smith remembers, quote, a short time before the house was completed, that was the frame house the Smiths were building, a man by the name of Josiah Stoll came from Shenandoah County, New York, to get Joseph to assist him in digging for a silver mine. He came for Joseph having heard that he was in possession of certain means, that would be his seer stone, by which he could discern things which could not be seen by the natural eye. Joseph endeavored to divert him from his vain project, but he was inflexible and offered high wages to such as would dig for him. And let me make a pause, by the way. The Smith family had made some terrible financial errors here and likely could not pay for the mortgage that their farm was on. They were in desperate need of money. So Joseph is going to take this job uh, to go dig. He offers back to the quote, uh, Joseph went to work for him. Consequently, he returned with the old gentleman and several others who were picked in the neighborhood and commenced digging. After laboring about a month without success, Joseph prevailed on his employer to cease his operations. It was from this circumstance, namely working uh, by the month at digging for a silver mine that the very prevalent story arose. Of his having been a money digger. Now, Joseph himself acknowledges this in an 1838 question and answer session with himself, by the way, in the Elder's Journal. Joseph says, question, was not Joseph Smith a money digger? And he answers, yes. But it was not a very profitable job for him as he only got $14 a month for it. Joseph never seems to evade that this was an activity that he did. So when Joseph goes down to Harmony, Pennsylvania to dig for Josiah Stoll, he goes down in roughly November, right before the winter, in 1825, and this is an illustration that I did showing Joseph. You can see him holding in his left hand there that chocolate uh, seer stone, trying to find and dig for this buried Spanish treasure, which they never do. Joseph looks and says he never sees anything there uh, for them to find. But while he's there, he boards with a local man in Harmony, um, a man named Isaac Hale. Isaac Hale has a separate little house. He's a very, Isaac Hale's very wealthy hunter uh, in the area of Harmony, Pennsylvania, and lets these boarders stay to come dig there. He even uh, assists them in some ways by helping them with their agreement. But Isaac Hale also has a beautiful daughter, uh, and her name is Emmy, as her friends call her, or we know her as Emma, Emma Smith. And Joseph and Emma fall in love and begin courting. Understandably, Isaac Hale is not happy with this when Joseph says that he wants to marry Emma. Joseph's going to return again in 1826 to try to win Emma and Isaac Hale's, well, he's already won Emma's favor, but to try to win Isaac Hale's favor. Isaac says no, and I think all fathers out there could understand. You know, he's Joseph's a stranger. Um, he looks in stones to find buried treasure. He's poor. He's illiterate. Um, he wants to her, marry his beautiful, refined, educated daughter. Um, he says no uh, to it. And, and so because of that, Joseph and Emma decide to elope, and they go get married by a justice of the peace. They then go up and live with Joseph's parents up in uh, Manchester for about a year. Now, the reason why I tell you that is because they're going to stay up there, and you'll see when I come back to the timeline. Joseph's now married, and during that year that he lives up in Manchester, will be when he obtains the gold plates. Now, the Hales are going to extend almost an olive branch to Joseph and Emma and say, come back. The Hales are going to offer Joseph and Emma a cute little house on a 13-acre property that borders the back of the Susquehanna River, and Joseph is going to end up taking that home to go live in it, and eventually, a few years later, he'll purchase that home. It will become the first home that Joseph purchases and after they've been married about a year, Joseph and Emma will go live there in Harmony, Pennsylvania. I'll talk about why in a second, but I want you to understand that the majority of the Book of Mormon, the vast majority of it will be translated in Harmony, Pennsylvania. When you go to 
Harmony, Pennsylvania today, sometimes we call it the Priesthood Restoration Site. We should also call it the Book of Mormon Translation Site. That is where uh, the majority of the Book of Mormon was translated and fell from the lips of Joseph Smith uh, as he dictated it to his scribes there. Okay, so now if you look at the timeline here, it's now December of 1827. Joseph gets the place in September, as you see on that first square. During those first few months from September through December, Joseph is going to have to protect the plates. This is where in Palmyra and Manchester area, all these people hear that Joseph has got the plates, hear the stories of him hiding them in the hearthstones and hiding them in barrels of beans and the cooper shop. And The people he's mainly having to hide them from, by the way, are his own friends, people like Samuel Lawrence and Willard Chase, who they know that Joseph has got the plates. As a matter of fact, Willard Chase will say that he and Samuel Lawrence went to the Hill Camorra and they saw the spot, the empty uh, place that Joseph retrieved the plates from. They told David Whitmer that they knew that Joseph had the plates. It's ironic that later in Joseph's life, most of the persecution that will come to him is because people don't believe that he had plates. The earliest persecution was because people were absolutely convinced that he did. That's an interesting thought. So because of that persecution in Palmyra and Harmony, Joseph, that's why he takes the offer to go down, uh, I'm sorry, in Palmyra and Manchester, that's why he takes the offer to go down to Harmony. And he's going to go live in Harmony, Pennsylvania, where there's some peace and quiet, and he can begin translating. So Joseph will begin translating sometime in December, January, January of 1828, that first part of that winter. From January all the way up for those first few months is that's when Joseph Smith will translate the book of Lehi those 116 pages we know of that he ends up losing. Martin Harris will come down, it's about 120 miles or so, from Palmyra down to Harmony. Martin Harris will go down there to assist Joseph. He's told Joseph that uh, he will pay to have the book published. Martin will also scribe. But back up, while he stays down there, he knows that his own wife in Palmyra, Martin's wife, Lucy Harris, is saying her husband's a fool and that he's been, you know, made a sucker and uh, been gullible by this Joseph Smith in the Book of Mormon. So Martin wants to take the pages, and you know the stories, I don't have to rehash them. Martin, Joseph asks the Lord, the Lord says no. Martin puts pressure on Joseph, and Joseph gives in, finally lets Martin take the pages, uh, and, he, and he takes those pages back to Palmyra. He breaks his covenant, Martin does, he shows them to more people than he should have. Those pages end up getting lost. You know the story. Joseph's heartbroken over it. As a matter of fact, he feels like he might have lost his opportunity and his gift because Moroni will take the plates away from Joseph Smith and the, and the breastplate. He'll get a revelation, Joseph will, after the 116 pages are lost. It's likely, by the way, his first written revelation and it's Doctrine and Covenants section 3. Now, if you've read section 3 with that background, wow, that is a rebuke of a section. It's a hopeful section, but it's also a stinging one. Uh, could you imagine, by the way, if section 3 was your first written revelation? Could you imagine Joseph walking around Harmony, Pennsylvania, and someone says to him, oh, hey, there's Joe, there's the prophet, hey, Joe, has God talked to you lately? And what if Joseph says, yeah, he, Talk to me this morning. Uh, oh yeah, what did he tell you? What if he pulls out section three, his first written revelation? Well, it says that I am basically a loser. <laughs> I boast in my own strength. I don't listen to God. I don't hearken to his counsels. I fear men more than God. If I keep this up, I will fall. Yeah, that's basically what the revelation says. How's your day going? That's kind of what section three is all about. Well, uh, luckily, Joseph repents. And in section 3, verse 10, if you would go open that section up and mark it, the Lord says, but remember, God is merciful. Therefore, repent. And Joseph does. And God re-gives him the plates in that sometime in that summer of 1828. His own mother goes and visits him, and by September uh, of 1828, the plates and the interpreters have been returned to Joseph. And Joseph picks up with sporadic translation again. 
from September of 1828 all the way through March of 1829. He uses Emma again. He uses Emma's brother, Reuben. Uh, Martin, you can't do it anymore. And Joseph's like, well, who, who can I have be my dedicated full-time scribe? And in March of 1829, Joseph gets a revelation that tells him to stand still and that God would send someone to him. And Joseph, a few weeks later, gets a knock on his door. Standing there is Joseph's brother, uh, his little brother, Samuel, and he's brought with him a friend, a local Palmyra school teacher named Oliver Cowdery. Joseph and Oliver had never met before this. Oliver had had some miraculous revelations. He had learned of the gold plates from the Smith family while teaching up in Palmyra. The Lord had shown them to him in a vision uh, in his own mind. The Lord had told Oliver that this was God's work and that if Oliver wanted to assist, that he could. So Oliver shows up in harmony, says, I'm here to assist. The next day, Joseph and Oliver transact some business, and two days later, Oliver begins to scribe the Book of Mormon. And Oliver will scribe the majority of the Book of Mormon as Joseph translates it there during the summer of 1829. So that's why when we talk about the Book of Mormon being translated, we say that Joseph did it in 65 working days. Well, this is happening over years, but the intensive period of the extant Book of Mormon that we have, most of it is translated by Joseph Smith beginning in April of 1829 through June of 1829. It is marvelous what is produced during that time period. So let's talk a little bit about the translation as a whole. This is an image that um, I painted of the Book of Mormon translation. And one of the reasons why I wanted to paint this image was because we have a lot of images of Joseph with the plates, the gold plates open, with his finger on the plates, um, with him thinking studiously, which uh, by some sources, Joseph did have the plates open. He did look at the plates and he did look on the plates. He did copy characters from the plates. But there are also other sources that say that Joseph would sometimes place the interpreters or maybe sometimes his brownstone in a hat, and that then looking on those stones, God would give Joseph words, and he'd look at those words and dictate the words that came to him, uh, which is where we get the Book of Mormon translation from. Before I did this painting, there weren't really any paintings of Joseph translating the Book of Mormon that way, and we learn a lot through art, one of my hobby horses. So I wanted to try to give a faithful image as best I could to that uh, way that Joseph translated. After I produced this painting, um, I had a lot of positive response to it. I had some negative response to it as well. One person asked me why I would produce anti-Mormon material uh, with my imagery if I believed in Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon, uh, which I do with my whole soul. I responded to them and shared with them some sources. And I said, well, here's some sources on the Book of Mormon translation on how Joseph brought it forward. How would you paint it? So these are some of the sources that I shared. The earliest source we have on the Book of Mormon translation is from Jonathan Hadley, who was a printer who was approached to possibly print the Book of Mormon. And um, Jonathan Hadley publishes this in August of 1829. It's the earliest, most contemporary source. He describes the, the translation. He says, he describes what the Book of Mormon looks like, which the only way he could have got that was from talking to Joseph or Martin or Hiram or Oliver Cowdery, but then he says, um, by, quote, by placing the spectacles in a hat and looking into it, Smith could, he said so at least, interpret these characters. And then he goes on to say, now it appears not a little strange that there should have been deposited in this western world and in the secluded town of Manchester, too, a record of this description, and still more so, that a person like Smith, very illiterate, should have been gifted by inspiration to read and interpret it. Jonathan Hadley doesn't know it, but he kind of gave the first testimony of the Book of Mormon. How many people do you meet and the way you describe them is very illiterate? I bet he was like, yeah, let, let's see what garbage comes out of this illiterate Smith farm boy. And then when you crack open the Book of Mormon, you have 500 some odd pages of beautiful, profound, consistent writing phrases like, I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded me. When you're in the service of your fellow beings, you're only in the service of your God. Wickedness never was happiness. I could go on and on. Jonathan Hadley doesn't realize that he just bore a testimony that 
uh, Joseph, with his illiterateness, couldn't have just made up the Book of Mormon. Well, back to this, though. Hadley says it was by placing the interpreters in a hat. Well, here's a more moderate translation source. Emma Smith, near the end of her life, in this interview with her son, says, quote, that she remembered Joseph sitting with his face buried in a hat with the stone in it and dictating hour after hour with nothing between us. Or here is a shaker uh, from the faith, the shaker faith, who remembers hearing Oliver Cowdery talk about the translation, that it was translated by, quote, two transparent stones in the form of spectacles through which the translator looked on the engraving and afterward put his face into a hat and the interpretation then flowed into his mind. So that's a little different. He looks on the plates, then places the stone in the hat and gets an interpretation of it. 1887, David Whitmer, late reminiscence, said that Joseph would put the seer stone in a hat, put his face into it, a piece of something resembling parchment would appear, and on that appeared the writing. Joseph would then dictate it and the scribe would write it down. Joseph Knight Sr., who also witnessed the translation, we don't know when he wrote this history, he remembers it this way, quote, now the way he translated was he put the Urim and Thummim into his hat and darkened his eyes. Then he would take a sentence and it would appear in bright Roman letters. Then he would tell the writer and he would write it. Then that would go away and the next sentence would come and so on. And I love this, in his, this is his own writing. But if it was not spelt right, it would not go away till it was right. Uh, they, they weren't much concerned about spelling. I think he means like the names there. But then he says, so we see that it was marvelous. Thus was the whole translated. So I just share a few of those sources because um, there seems to have been a hat involved or stones placed in a hat sometimes. Now, I want to be very clear here. We need to be careful as the collective church becomes more comfortable or knowledgeable about this hat narrative that we don't swing pendulums too far. There are sources that exist for both sides, open plates, uh, looking on plates, interpreting characters. There's also sources of looking in hat, looking at the stones and the words coming on stones. Here's just one source that says that, by the way. Uh, this was one person who had an interview with Oliver Cowdery in Winter Quarters in 1847, just showing the other side. He remembers, quote, Cowdery represents Joseph as sitting by a table with the plates before him, and he reading the record with the Urim and Thummim. Oliver, his scribe, sits close beside to hear and write every word is translated. This is done by holding the translators over the words of the written record, and the translation appears distinctly in the instrument, which had been touched by the finger of God and dedicated and consecrated for the express purpose of translating. So, again, we have to be careful um, to not swing it as either or, or only this or only that. It's probably more of a, instead of an either or, it's probably an and and both as to how Joseph brought forth the Book of Mormon. At the whole of it, though, I want to get back to what Emma said and what Joseph Knight Sr. said, and that one of, that one of my friends and colleagues, uh, Professor Michael McKay, likes to say that the Book of Mormon was a miracle, and we can't only reduce the Book of Mormon down to some sort of an intellectual exercise. Only God can make words appear on a stone to give an interpretation of an ancient record of an ancient people, and that then that was dictated into our uh, English and, and language today. That's a miracle, and the Book of Mormon translation was a miracle. If we become too fixated on the mechanics of it, I'm not even sure Joseph understood the mechanics of it. All he knows, Joseph summarized it by saying, I translated this book by the gift and power of God, and that God gave him these words to interpret the characters by using the spectacles and these Urim and Thummim. Sometimes Joseph would say, by means of Urim and Thummim. And if we focus too much on the process and not enough on the product, we're missing it. And we can't miss it, uh, sisters and brothers. We've got to look at the product. Somewhere, somehow, we got this book, this Book of Mormon. Somebody wrote those 500 some odd pages. And we only have a few options of how that marvelous Book of Mormon came forward. Either Joseph made it up, like I said, 
he's some sort of a religious genius and this was some sort of a religious performance that Mozart-ish, once in a lifetime, once every few thousand years, something like this happens, that surely is an option to consider. However, that's not how Joseph himself describes it. Joseph says, no, I found a record, God led me to it, he gave me stones to interpret it, words appeared on these stones according to these other sources, and Joseph dictated the record by the gift and power of God. Joseph does say this record that he brought forth by the gift and power of God becomes the keystone of our religion, the keystone of our faith. Joseph calls it the most correct of any book on the earth. And by the way, that doesn't mean there's not errors. The Book of Mormon itself gives the upfront in the title page, if there are mistakes, if there are faults, they're, they're the mistakes of men because people were involved in this. But the revelations, the truths in there are true. The Lord himself even bore his testimony that the translation of the Book of Mormon is correct and true. And by most correct, too, it doesn't mean that there's not sentence issues or punctuation or word problems. He didn't say it's the most eloquent or the most uh, grammatically perfect. Most correct likely has to do with that it contains the most purity of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the fullness of the gospel, faith, repentance, baptism, Holy Ghost, continuing in the faith, the doctrine of Christ, creation, fall, atonement. Uh, that is littered throughout uh, the testimony in the pages of the Book of Mormon. Uh, the Book of Mormon has depths and marvels to it that we as a collective church have only begun uh, to plumb, and I hope we all continue to study and love this marvelous book that provides a foundation for our faith, a foundation for our doctrine, a foundation for our witness of Jesus Christ, and our foundation for our witness of the prophetic mission of Joseph Smith. Every time you hold that book, you're holding tangible evidence that God does indeed call holy prophets, that he did call Joseph, that Jesus is the Christ, that this is his latter-day work and glory, and that uh, because of this, the Book of Mormon continues to be a marvel. It's a marvel to me, just like it was a marvel to the early saints. I hope it's a marvel to you. And God bless you and me as we plumb the depths of the marvelous uh, Book of Mormon.